Okay. Well, welcome everyone. Um, I'm really uh, excited to introduce our speaker for today. Our speaker is April Haywood. She's the STEM program manager from South Carolina at, at South Carolina EPSCOR. Um, I hope you're able to see her abstract. The title of her talk is AI and Social Sciences. April is a public administration doctoral researcher, ASPA, American Society for Public Administration, a Times columnist, R programmer, and public sector practitioner. She's also a fourth year doctoral student in the Doctor of Public Administration program in the Department of Political Science at Valdosta State University. Her research interests are in computational social science, data science, e-government, machine learning, public administration, public policy, research methods, and social media research. That's a lot, super interesting. She integrates data science and artificial intelligence algorithms and our programming, our programming, excuse me, specifically our studio into her research and her research methods. Her long-term research focuses on how data science and artificial intelligence can inform and solve complex tame and wicked problems in public administration, public policy, and other sub-disciplines of the social sciences. So really pleased to have, um, have April here today. Um, so anytime we're ready, we can get started. Thank you very much for the invitation to present tonight, our, well, night here for me, uh, afternoon <laughs> for you uh, and everything. Thank you very much. I'm really excited. Uh, about this. I'm going to share my slides here. All righty, can you see my screen and me rotating? Okay, great. So I'm April Hayward. Um, I'm going to talk about AI and the social sciences. So for me, I actually, within maybe the last four to five years, have gotten into programming, uh, into Sorry, into programming. Sorry, the noise is outside. Uh, into our programming, uh, and then from there into data science, into machine learning, and so much. You know, uh, we, when I talk to different people, it's kind of like this, like the private club of the computer sciences. It's not, and so it's applicable to every discipline. And historically, and then I talk about computational social science, which is. Uh, historically, that's where a computer scientist and a social scientist would collaborate uh, uh, to execute comp computational social science. But in recent trends, in recent decades, social scientists such as myself were being trained. We received training to where we can employ computational methods in our research. So social sciences it, it encompasses a range of disciplines, which are some for the research interests that were written, that were uh, announced uh, a few minutes ago. And I uh, just wanna show some aspects. There's so much that I do. I wish I had more time, but I'm gonna show a little snippet, literally a little snippet of like what I do. So I wanna start with talking about my research interests and current research projects. And I always have to start about talk about Dr. Herbert Simon. Uh, he has had a tremendous, uh, huge influence on my research. Um, he is one of the pioneer scholars uh, to contribute to artificial intelligence uh, and even continues to be revered in the public administration, psychology, economics, and, com and computer science disciplines. Uh, Dr. Simon, he put forward in his book, The Sciences of Artificial, which is literally right there behind me, uh, in his book, he characterized AI as systems developed by humans to achieve goals and to function. Artificial intelligence emerged out of the computer science discipline. Uh, the discipline can be segmented into subdisciplines uh, such as machine learning, supervised uh, learning, unsupervised learning, semi-supervised learning, artificial intelligence, neural networks, deep learning, on and on and on and on and on. And I always wonder, recently I was in a meeting, uh, the question as an icebreaker was asked, who would you want to talk to dead or alive and why? And the person that came to mind was Dr. Herbert Simon. Now you think about when he first, one of the, literally one of the pioneers of this discipline, what would he think about the advancements of AI and how it has branched out its academic discipline? Look at how AI has been so, uh, has been employed with COVID-19 responses around, you know, patrol robots, uh, just all the things has been developed 
uh, and everything just over the years, what would he think about that? That's, that was my response and wish I could talk to him, but just a tremendous um, impact on my research. So as mentioned, and it is actually, this has actually evolved over time. So as researchers, you, you're inquisitive. Oh, you see something, I wanna know more about that. I wanna do research on that and just evolve. So this has not been like always the case with this. So computational social science, that is just really just employing computational methods in the social sciences, uh, more and more into that. A uh, really great book by Dr. Michael Alvarez, a uh, really great book, please read that on that, really great big book that talks more and more about social scientists using computational methods. Of course, data science, decision science is one of the more recent ones, like, you know, why are decisions made the way that they're made? Uh, just the science behind that. E-government, which is the focus of my dissertation. I'm actually in the dissertation phase of my doctoral program. So that is kind of the focus of that electronic government, machine learning, public administration, public policy. Uh, those are sub-disciplines of the social sciences, research methods and social media research. And so uh, those are my research interests. So some just a really quick kind of, uh, some of my current research projects, and this is probably, probably more so the aim of the talk, my talk today. I have a quantitative project that's uh, titled uh, Data Science and Machine Learning Approach to Comparative COVID-19 Policy Responses. So the aim was to investigate health and economic policy response to the COVID-19 pandemic in developed countries and developing countries. Prior research indicated more rigorous research is needed for the contribution to the body of knowledge from a public policy perspective. Um, and my aim with this is really to answer how data science and machine learning uh, can inform public policy about the COVID-19 pandemic and what is the state of COVID-19 pandemic in developed and developing countries. Um, this is going more so tied to my, my dissertation, measuring the effectiveness of e-government delivery models from a public administration perspective. And this came about because so much literature, when I first got started looking at this a couple of years ago, is so grounded in the information sciences uh, perspective, that discipline. But, you know, e-government is really a byproduct of public administration and information systems. And so I'm looking more at the PA aspect of that and looking at the state of e-government delivery uh, models globally. And another part of what I'm going to talk about today is having just a public administration research approach to an empirical perspective of COVID-19, more so because when so much, so much research is coming out, and although that COVID-19 is a wicked problem, it's a wicked problem, but it really just provided like just, just seeing scientists like Everybody's trying to attack the problem. They're doing research and, you know, what are the answers? We have questions after questions after questions. How do we answer that across disciplines? And initially so much is coming in for, out from an epidemiology uh, perspective, other disciplines of public, uh, public health. But there's so much, I say, let's look at this from a public policy, a, a PA perspective as well. And so just really excited. I get really excited about research and, and all of this. Um, and this is something initially over time, the longest one is about integration challenges and future research, our future direction of data science and public administration. And how is that applied in public administration? And I'm answering that more and more over the years as I do different projects and things like that. So R Studio, so we have R. R is a programming language. There's R, there's Python, there's other languages. There's R, and I look at this and really there's the R ecosystem versus the Python ecosystem. So people who, who, are, who use Python sometimes think that nothing can be done outside of Python. That is incorrect. You could do data science, you do machine learning, you can do all these things. So I am the R ecosystem. Uh, and R Studio is a specific system software that I use for all of my research. It is really truly one of my happy places. Like when I open the screen, like, you, have you ever seen the Febreze commercials where, except I don't put my nose in the carpet, but you see that you have the Febreze commercial, you're like, just the happy place. So for me, this is exactly, you know, how I feel uh, when, I'm in our, when, I'm, when I'm in our studio and just programming. And I can program for hours and it's like the next day. And so uh, this is just for me, and I'm gonna go more, I'm gonna more so focus on uh, how I use Twitter which is a data scientist treasure trove. Oh my gosh. 
It is a treasure trove. And so uh, just to kind of show different ways of how I use uh, how I use uh, machine learning and this, but I'm going to focus more so on machine learning this evening uh, and everything of how I use it in my research and, and in practice. So how do I use our studio? I use it for data science, data wrangling and cleaning. I do data analysis, visualizations. I, I employ it for statistics. I don't use SPS. I know how to use it, but it's like why I have R. Uh, machine learning, text mining, natural language processing, sentiment and emotions analysis. Uh, I pulled Twitter data via my Twitter developer account through our studio and decision trees and on and on and on and on. And decision trees more so I'm going to use that more so for to do for predictions. So Twitter, a Twitter, a data scientist treasure trove, like just the 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 a number of tweets. I was so surprised how much over time. So I started uh, pulling data in February of this year. Uh, from so many different ways of looking at uh, just doing research on different weathers related to COVID-19 uh, intervention, uh, public policy, public health. And recently I started doing more, getting more into climate change, climate change, climate change policy, extreme weather. And so with this, and because I think I've so far to date have probably close to 2 million tweets over several months on different topics, different searches, you have to keep a data log. You have to curate your data. You have like you, you, have, you always have to have that. So over time, and this is just an example of what I what I do, I catalog the data that I pull, that this is the search criteria, whether it's by hashtag and it's literally like this, or just search for words. The date that I pull the Twitter data, um, and that is pulling, that can pull up to the previous seven days of tweets. Uh, but then there's the number of tweets that I pull by that search and then the date range. So for instance, with stimulus checks, uh, the tweets that I pulled at the time, this was in February, uh, 1,113 tweets, uh, that, those tweets there, that range from February 8th, 2021 to February 16th, 2021. And I put time zone because when I'm pulling, because this is globally, I'm pulling this globally all around the world, what is available on Twitter at that time. And so pulling that. So I look at that by the hashtag and, and just by that search criteria. The American Rescue Plan, which is an intervention of the United States uh, to address uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. It's a combination of interventions from uh, health interventions, economic, social welfare policy, all those things. Booster shots, uh, more recent. How do people feel about booster shots? I use a lot of this as well sometimes for assessing what is the public opinion of. Uh, hashtag COVID-19, the coronavirus. Uh, COVID-19 with the dash and without the dash. It really makes a difference sometimes when you're pulling in tweets and stuff and information to see how that, you know, what you get. Uh, COVID-19 vaccine with and without the dash. And so with that, so just the dates of that. Um, and there's something else, and also add, let me back up really quick to a comments column. So I'll make notes to myself here. I make notes in our studio when I'm doing things, if I need to delete or different things or something on the news is happening at that time that may impact uh, the tweets, the, the tweets that made that that had that uh, that uh, that I pull in. Um, also, I also look at the Delta variant. I, just, I started looking at the Delta variant becoming so much prominent in June. So just pulling it by the hashtag and just Delta variant itself, so much data from that. And the gamma variant, hashtag and without the hashtag. The different types of vaccines, the J&J &J vaccine. Uh, and just as just a note, when as I say a note, something. So on this particular day that I pulled by just the search criteria, J&J &J vaccine, the CDC and FDA announced plans to pause Johnson & Johnson vaccine due to rare blood clots since the last data extracted. So the last time I pulled this data, the CDC pulled. So when I heard on that day, I said, okay, let me go in and pull the data. What, is, what are people saying about J&J &J at this time? Uh, also, uh, Moderna booster. So different types of versions, variations of Johnson & Johnson, the Moderna bo uh, booster, uh, Moderna vaccine. And this is more a note for myself, but example of comments to come that today uh, it was announced the FDA will not extend the shelf life of J&J &J vaccines, but will extend the shelf life of the Moderna vaccine. So I'm going to pull J&J &J and Moderna vaccine related tweets later on. 
Uh, but just to make a note of that, because sometimes that influences if tweets would go up or go down, and then what people are saying about a particular topic. Uh, Pfizer vaccine, uh, Paycheck Protection Program, which is another intervention of the United States government, uh, the Pfizer booster, social distancing, vaccine, wear a mask is such a controversial topic to say if you should cover up your nose and mouth and there's an infectious disease on the earth, but it is a controversial topic if you should cover up your mouth. So I, and your nose and mouth. So I started looking at this in, in February and I said, because things are going to the point of people filing lawsuits and all those things. I said, let me just go back. I hadn't pulled it in months. So here, last I pulled with the hashtag was in May. So let me go and look and see what has happened because more and more things are in the news about that to pull that as well. And climate change, recently started looking more into climate change. That's one of the newest kind of research areas that I've just, just interested, just wanted to see more about. So that's why this, the numbers in these areas here, kind of looking at climate change and extreme weather. So to date, I've pulled almost 2 million tweets. <laughs> so that's what that is, over time. And so I log all of it because it's a lot of data and everything. So let's just to kind of put some things in perspective of just the total amount of tweets is just interesting by hashtag search criteria, just some numbers here, like total from when I started looking at topics to current, this is just some of that, or I'm gonna run like down every single number here for you, but just the total number of tweets and have some notes at the end, Delta variant, just different things over time. Uh, and so some notes from this is that with the Twitter search criteria, I'm gonna show you some examples of what I do as well. Interesting, you pull more tweets without the hashtags than you do with hashtags uh, the, uh, for most of the things that you pull. The COVID-19 vaccine Twitter search yielded more most tweets out of everything I've searched to date. The highest is about the vaccine. Uh, there are more Delta variant tweets than Gamma variant tweets. And more so, at least in the United States, is the Gamma variant is not as prevalent as compared to the Delta variant. Uh, the Moderna vaccine Twitter was actually more popular and yielded more tweets as compared to the Pfizer and Johnson and Johnson 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 vaccine, and the Pfizer booster Twitter search uh, yielded more tweets as compared to the Moderna uh, booster Twitter uh, search. So I want to show examples. So different things I talked about earlier that I do sentiment emotions uh, analysis of tweets, and I also do text mining, additional text mining algorithms of that. So I pull the, the tweets in, and then what is next? So how do you pull Twitter data? So I access, I have a Twitter developer account. You have to be approved by Twitter. You have to submit an application to Twitter. Uh, you know, you get permission, uh, you, you know, describing the purpose of why you want your Twitter developer account, your, how you plan to use Twitter. And so and it has to be approved. It's not necessarily a, like an automatic approval. So it has to be approved by Twitter. So I access my Twitter developer account in our studio when I get started. Um, and you need your app name, consumer key, consumer secret, access token, and access secret. Uh, then I load uh, the R tweet package. The name of the package is called R tweet. I load that into R Studio, and then I program code R Studio to search and pull tweets. And I do this by criteria, the number of tweets to pull. And should retweets be included, which I don't actually include retweets. Uh, and then I save my Twitter results as a .csv file. So this is an example of, as you see, just coding, like, for example, like uh, the Delta variant. So I'm telling our studio, okay, this is, you know, I'm naming what I want my file to be. I'm telling the, the types of tweets. I'm telling this is what I want, you know, to, uh, our students to search for. And in this case was the hashtag Delta variant the number of tweets I want to, the maximum number of tweets that I want to pull. Now, depending on what Twitter uh, approves you for, they have a maximum number of tweets that you can pull every 15 minutes. They have a maximum, so you get to your maximum, you have to wait 15 minutes before you could do that again. And then also to, I save, this is just write as, write underscore as, as CSV in terms of saving my files. So I pull that in from Twitter in our studio, and then I save my files. And so it automatically saves a CSV uh, and it saves it uh, in the cloud for me. So I have it because when you lose, you know, work with a lot of data, you need a lot of storage space <laughs> uh, for that. So first thing I want to talk about, and just show an example of, let's say, going back to the American Rescue Plan Act. 
Uh, this is an intervention. It was a combination of the health, economic, education, and social welfare, the welfare policy interventions. And some of the features of the American Rescue Plan include COVID-19 vaccinations, economic relief to small businesses, state and local governments and individuals, unemployment benefits, housing assistance, agriculture and nutrition programs, and stimulus payments up to $1,400, which was one of the most popular features uh, of the American Rescue Plan. And so I put this timeline because it correlates to the tweets that I pulled and what was happening and when. So this was proposed in January of 2021. The US House of Representatives started working on the budget resolution in February 2nd. This was then introduced in the House, formally introduced in the House, uh, February 24th. It passed the House in February, later that February, passed the Senate in early March. The US House agreed to the Senate amendment on March 10th, and it was signed into law by President Joe Biden on March 11th. The IRS started processing direct payments on March 12th. So I pulled uh, American Rescue Plan tweets uh, by hashtag and without the hashtag. So I did this emotion analysis. I did want to just, you know, getting a sense of how people feel about the American Rescue Plan. What is the, uh, what is the public opinion of that? So this data, this date here is a date I pulled the data. Uh, and so uh, I pulled the data on this one, particular one on February 16, 2021. And again, when you pull data, it can pull up to seven days uh, to the previous tweets, depending on the maximum number of that. So you get to kind of just really see what people were thinking and feeling uh, positive at that time. And again, going back to the timeline here, you can kind of see where people are. They're excited about that. And, uh, and also to stimulus payments, all the relief that's coming to address the pandemic, because it was a multi-purpose, um, multi-purpose uh, interventions here for, for the, in the United States. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the differences here uh, a little bit later between this. So then I, on, on March 10, 2021, I do a, run another analysis of the tweets that pull that again, going back to up to seven days of tweets pulling that in. So if we look at, for instance, anticipation on February 6, we see like the emotions of that 6,194 tweets, like they analyzed that, okay, anticipating this. But then as things are progressing, you know, in the United States Congress, we see anticipation is skyrocketed up to 40,000. So we see the emotions of that, what people are thinking, uh, what they're feeling uh, about that. And then also positive, negative, and all the other emotions of that. I get the question sometime, like, what does it mean anticipation or why this particular emotion, all of that? So it really depends on the package you use our package you use, and then also the dictionary that particular package use and how it characterizes emotions and sentiments and things like that. And then also, again, anticipation is, is high at this point, continuing to be high as well, anticipation positive. And these are the two most ranked emotions uh, of the analysis of this. I'm going to add some more context here for you. So again, anticipation and positive emotions were the top emotions in the analysis in response to this intervention. Now, trust, surprise, joy, negative, fear, sadness, disgust, and anger emotions were the highest when the US House agreed with the amended bill from the Senate, and that was later sent for, to the, for a signature to put into law. So there are questions when I do this sometimes, like, well, why is this positive? Why is this negative? So this is where you do other things and do other text mining. So an analyzing tweets in a different way to add more context to that. But this is just an example, of, again, of how I use Twitter, how I use machine learning. And through this, I'm using natural language processing, all of these things. And so these are the results of that. But this is where, as a researcher, you see this, okay, then why? Why is this? Why is that? I want to dig deeper, 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 deeper into that. So um, recently I started looking into booster shots. You know, that's the thing, you know, when, uh, when will the booster shots be available? Whether it's Pfizer, Moderna, J&J, &J, uh, when are the booster shots and who's el eligible and when? And so uh, there was, I think a September 20th date that was put out there. Oh, okay, this will be available. Then, you know, FDA is like, well, no, we're gonna wait. CDC then had a different comment to say who's eligible and when. And so I believe just the Moderna boost, I think, was the one. It was supposed to be Pfizer, but then it ended up being Moderna that was supposed to be available. I think later Pfizer. And then 
who are, what populations will be able to access that. So I started pulling tweets about that. What are people thinking and, and, and feeling about the booster shots in general by hashtag booster shots and then booster shots without the hashtag. And so uh, I just, again, the notions, and this is just showing a script of, uh, of just kind of me in our studio uh, and doing this. So some of the things that goes into sentiment analysis that, you know, when I pull in Twitter data, you literally pull in what is there. But you have to clean the data. So stripping the hashtags, you know, removing punctuations and all sorts of other things. Uh, you're cleaning your data. You have to get it to a point of where it's clean to then begin your analysis. So that's those are some of the things that are used. So there's a number of steps that gets to this point. So I'm showing you this, but there's like 10 steps that led to this particular outcome here. So, and then from there, I'm, I'm having to talk about the source, what emotions should be there and all those things and, uh, and, and all those things and different steps and sources and steps of have to do that to just to show that uh, there. So booster analysis, so I, I did this on September 24th. So this is very recent data and with this. And so how are people feeling just the emotions of that? How do they feel about uh, booster shots with the hashtag? Well, over they're they're more so they're they're positive emotions there. Uh, over them is the highest one with that. And again, uh, with when, when you're pulling you know uh, pulling Twitter data, uh, you get more tweets without the hashtag than with the hashtag. So this is with the hashtag. And so with the emotions of that and, and this and who should get it and when and all the other things that are happening um, there. And then also just kind of having the uh, there's negative emotions about that. There's fear, different things like that. But then from just from this, uh, then I'm going back to now look at this with no hashtag. So I'm pulling in way more, more, more tweets as compared to uh, as compared to with the hashtag. And again, going, this is just showing a sample of the cleaning process. There's more steps above that. What I'm telling our studio to remove, to clean this up and emotions and this plot. Uh, this, this, um, the emotions of what to look for, and then how to plot uh, the results of the analysis and all of that. So this is what this is showing here. And so with that, so if we then look at um, the results of this, and that there's way more positive, more positive a, a difference, you know, without the hashtag that it pulls in more to show more people are more I have more positive emotions um, about uh, the booster as compared to negative here. Um, and so there's trust in, there's some trust, but not too huge variance between that and fear. People have different thoughts and if they should get, you know, even vaccinated period and things like that, what are potential results, all those things like that. And so those are some of the things just to kind of show the differences between with the hashtag and without the hashtag. But just to give some kind of context to that. So uh, then I started looking into the Delta variant in, in the summer. So it seems at one point we were coming out of all of this and things were getting better to trying to get to some sort of sense of normalcy. And then the Delta variant, which is the dominant variant in the United States, uh, and just and even more, there's varying impacts depending on the state that you're in. So recently in, in the state that I live in, cases were getting to like five, 6,000 a day. And so, but that's not the case in all states. And so it really depends on where you are. And then so, but the state of Maryland is supposed to be one of the safest states in the United States, you know? So depending on where you are, but the Delta is becoming so prevalent and so dominating things. You think of the increase of deaths and cases and all those things that are related to the Delta variant. So, so now I want to start looking more into this. So I started looking into this about mid-June and just, I look at this just about every week, pulling tweets, what are things, seeing where things are. And so of that, so I wanted to do an analysis, like what are people thinking of, of that? So uh, interesting enough, when I I first saw this result, uh, this is in June. So I just compared when I first started looking at the Delta variant. Uh, this is, a, I pulled this on June 16, 2021. And then I compared it to uh, the last time I pulled, if, pulled data, which was on September 24th. I just want to see from the beginning to where are we now? What are 
people thinking about that. So both of these are without Twitter hashtags. And so positive emotions, say, okay, positive. I wonder what that is about. So that means I need to do more research, do more text mining. I want to delve more into specific sentences and what are some phrases, things that people are talking about on Twitter. Like it's kind of like, okay, positive. But I guess depending on where you are in the country and, and where, and in this case, I'm back up to say country, but where you are in the world, because I'm pulling tweets and this is from, this is globally. And so in negative emotions uh, where people are thinking, uh, trust, I'm going to break down kind of where emotions are, are it's, of course, this. And then uh, this is I'm doing an analysis of as of September 24th of that, just showing, um, showing, I just wanted to show the difference between when I first started and then the last time that I pulled uh, the data. And so uh, again, positive, a, a bit more difference between positive and negative emotions of that is just interesting to like what is, and I asked that question more so depending on where you are. So I could be very happy about progress uh, in terms of like is, you know, in some places that is not as prevalent and other places, um, you know, things of that nature. And so it'd be interesting to kind of know more about that, which I'll talk about follow up of that later. So as I compare between, you know, when I pulled the data in June and I went to pull it again in, in September, I wanted to look at just some of the emotions to see what people were thinking. So the positive emotion actually increased from June to, to when I pulled it in September. Interesting, so uh, with that. The negative emotion decreased, uh, uh, decreased somewhat between June and September. The trust emotion increased uh, between from June to September. The fear emotion decreased. The sadness emotion increased, and the anger emotion increased, and disgust emotion decreased. So I thought it was interesting to kind of see just to show this. Now I have more data that I'm showing you where I can go week by week by week to see where things are and that. But I just want just to show you know just kind of a snapshot of like when I first you know, looked at this. And then the last time I looked at, which again, this is about September 24th was the last time I pulled that, that, that data. So just to kind of some notes of that, it was just really interesting. So um, for me, next steps, um, I'm going to continue text mining, uh, varying Twitter search criteria, because again, like for instance, like I was talking about the results of the Delta variant uh, emotions analysis, it showed that the top emotion was positive. And I kind of want to know why. Is that good? Is it bad? Is it what is it good? You know, the vaccines become available. Like what is contributing? It's more so what is contributing to the analysis of this. And so I'm interested to know more about that. So and when I talk more about text mining, I'm still using natural language processing. I'm using packages like TM. Uh, you do tidy text, you're going through different stages, you're cleaning, again, another cleaning process of the Twitter data. So then I'm looking more so at the words of actual tweets and I'm looking at engrams. Uh, engrams is bigrams, like what is the most common, you know, two words in the tweets or, or trigrams. Um, what are the top statements and things? Just to add more context to, to see if there's a correlation between those results to just looking at sentiment analysis about different topics. Um, another thing, and this is not an exhaustive list of things I'm going to be working on, but just, just to give you an idea, um, I'm going to be working on uh, just employing random forests to make predictions. So you think about, for instance, the Titanic. And so if, you, if you've, you've done any of the Kaggle competition, I wish I had time. <laughs> <laughs> to participate. If you heard of Kaggle and they have those competitions and you could, you know, to really participate in that. But if you looked at that, and so where I would start thinking about that is that you, uh, you can go Google this and look this up. So uh, this was actually used to make predictions of who was going to die on the Titanic. So if you were from this location, if you were male, female, you had this kind of, you know, economic background, were you at the top of the ship or were you at the bottom of the ship, the middle of the ship, and did where you picked up in, in, in England or here and there. So it's taking you through all these things and expands and is making a prediction of who was, and, and it's, it's really kind of bad to say somebody's gonna die, but that was the purpose of that, of, of that. But I said, well, started looking at what are some other surveys or other survey data or other things out there to look at that using this to make predictions on the results of that. So I'm looking into that to look more and more into that. 
And I'm also, of course, following, you know, climate change, uh, you know, and that. So we, we have a new presidential administration, a new U.S. government administration, more and more, you know, you know, of course, all they do, they want to focus more and more on addressing climate change because it is real, you know, it, it's real. Like, it, you know, the middle, you know, it shouldn't like be snowing here in like May. You know, and you know, just things like why is it snowing at <laughs> this time of the year? All right, but so I'm looking more and more into climate change uh, and we'll continue to do this. I just started looking at that and continue to integrate data science and machine learning uh, into that. So to just look at, look at climate change. So just wanted to get of that. And then as well as uh, the tweets that I showed you before, I, there's so much for me to analyze, I, I mean, so much to analyze from so many different perspectives, so many different papers. So I am a columnist for PA Times. So my next article will be out in a couple of weeks. So I really have already started doing more text mining of the Delta variant because it's going to talk about, I want to talk more about, like I just told you that the sentiment analysis. So I'm going to talk more about, okay, results of other text mining that I've employed to get deep, do a deeper dive into the Delta variant, what people are thinking uh, with that, and then also looking into the boosters and things of that nature. I was a little bit more surprised that Moderna booster is more uh, more popular as compared to the Pfizer booster. Uh, you know, things like that. J and J just doesn't. It has not been popular in Twitter searches. It was just really one of those things that was surprising. It just wasn't as popular. And then when tweets were going up, when there was announced by the CDC or the FDA and things like that, but it was just the lowest of that. And so just people thoughts on vaccines and different things like that. So a number of things. So just is, is pulling all this data, but there's so much information I don't know yet because you can have data but you need the information. So you have to, there's a difference between the two. So I just wanted to just really share, this is really truly like a true snapshot of just the work you know, that I do. I really enjoy this. Uh, even when I'm beyond graduate school and everything, this is something that's ongoing and just so many different things to just do that. Uh, and so I also want to teach more and more social science students how to do this because there is just this human resource shortage across disciplines of individuals who can, who know statistics and who can program and, and all those things. And it's just, again, this is not the private club or the computer science discipline office, anybody who's watching in the computer sciences, but there it's across disciplines and there is a learning curve of that, but more and more is needed. And so for me, one of those things is like, no, I need, I want to teach more and more students, you know, we get on the ground floor, how to program. Of course, I'm partial to R, so teaching R and uh, the R language. Uh, but of course, if they want to go into Python, it's up to them. But to show them what they could do with that, because even if you, whatever sector you're in, whatever academic discipline you're, you're in, you need a data scientist. And even now with more and more social scientists employing computational method, methods, you need a social scientist like myself who use computational methods as well. So that's one of my things of just doing this and just also as well as that more and more to address the human resource. So this, it's a global shortage, not enough people that can employ this and everything. So, um, but I just wanted to, uh, just to share a snippet of that. Uh, we're going to leave some time if there's questions and all of that as well, but I just wanted to show a snippet of that. This is my contact information uh, and everything, april.hayward at outlook.com if you want to email me. I do have a website. I didn't put it here because I'm doing redevelopment of my website and it's gonna take a little bit to update some things, put some new projects, videos and things like that. So right now, if you go to aprilhayward.com, you're gonna get like, this is kind of a private, you won't be able to get to it now. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. Um, I talk about my research, next articles, things like that. You can connect with me on LinkedIn uh, as well. And so, but I really appreciate your time today just to talk about just, this literally is just scraping, not even really scraping the surface of what I do with artificial intelligence. It truly is so fascinating and everything, but I really wanna thank you for your time today. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, April. That was, that was fascinating. Um, I'm sure we, we have plenty of time for questions, so we can do it two ways. Folks, you can put your questions in the chat if you like, or just 
raise your hand or just shout it out. Any questions for April? Let's see. Who's got a question? Oh, thank you. Thank you, Maria. Well, April, I have a question. Um, sure. So when you do the when you do the sentient analysis, then um, do you look for do you look for trends that change over time? Is there another meta analysis that you do of that data? Uh, do you look at mm -hmm. pairs of things or occurrences of things? I'm just wondering. I think it's so interesting to see those trends change. You know, depending. Yeah, that's why. I, that's why I use. That's why I pull on a regular basis. So it's literally on my calendar that mm -hmm. I wait about just about every seven days. Like it's literally on my like like before I just started pulling. Sorry about the car that's going out here, but uh, but I literally it's on my calendar like every seven days to pull different searches. And so when I'm beginning to see tweets to kind of decreasing, like there's not a whole lot of chatter about J and J. It isn't something that I'm going to look at every week. But I'm just seeing content just continuous on Delta variant booster shots or things like that. I'm going to continue to look at. But I do that and I and I look at that to measure change. Mm -hmm. So is there a trend? And so that's why I wanted to show an example of like, okay, what are thoughts on the Delta variant uh, before, you know, when I started looking at this in June to the last time I pulled. So this weekend, I'm gonna be pulling more data on a lot of the topics and things like that. But that's one of the things that, I, that also helps me to look at trends. And a different aspects of that, like I said more, and just looking specifically at this, because this is just talking about emotions, but you don't know what was actually said. And so that's where you do a deeper dive into using text mining, using natural language processing. And when you use that, it depends on, and I didn't want to say a specific package because depending on what R package you use, because they have built-in dictionaries and have options of like the words of how is it synthesizing the word and things of that nature. It really depends on what you're using, which I don't want to say one, because if, and so I, another way to look at measuring change is that if I use a different package for just an analyzing sentiment using a different dictionary on the same tweets, what would be the differences in, in mm -hmm. that? So it really depends on what you're using and everything and just, just going from there. Um, so I hope that was some of the way of just kind of answering uh, yeah. that. But it's, it's really fascinating because I just looked at this in December. It's like October, I'm still looking at stuff. And so- <laughs> Is 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 yeah. It's just interesting. So yeah. Yeah, we have some we have some in some questions in the chat. I'm just going to call on folks. Laura, do you want to ask your question? Sure. I was just wondering about using Twitter as a representative or non-representative sample of the population, particularly when it comes to policy and policy opinions. Yeah, so with that, because really, this is really, I just really started doing a deeper dive into Twitter this year. So really looking at what you're looking at, depending on what you want to look at, you would do just kind of like with other research, like, you know, what you need to determine your sample, your sample size. And so you want to, because that sample size is going to be kind of representative of the greater population. And so for me, in my case, and so depending on, you know, what Twitter approves you for, the number of tweets, so there's a maximum. Like for me, every 15 minutes, the maximum fee is like I can pull 18,000 tweets max every 15 minutes. This is why you were seeing my data stopping at like 17,999. <laughs> and so depending on the level of access that Twitter gives you. So that's why I was like, I'll pull, if it gets up to close to 18,000, I'll wait 15 minutes and then I'll pull again. So it may take me hours as I'm going through different uh, Twitter searches and stuff like that. But it, with this, it, would really, would, it wouldn't be any different. So I'm really building data over time to begin to look at that. You know, I wouldn't want to say, oh, one time, then this is definitive. This is over time looking at trends and things that, and building that up over time. Great. OK, Thank let's you. see. Uh, uh, Bjorn, do you have a question? You do uh, have a question. Yeah, I was wondering if the you had more error in the sentiment analysis when it was tweets about more technical things. So if like, there was more errors, you're saying? 
Yeah. So tweets about more scientific concepts with jargon uh, versus like maybe general political concepts or so it would be mm -hmm. like vaccine versus like a lockdown, say like one might have much more jargon. Does sentiment analysis work better in, in that? I uh, think in the one with less jargon is kind of my question. I don't know, but I think I would be able to answer that. I'm making a hypothesis here. I think that would be better when I do a deeper dive looking at more into this is just one way of analyzing the tweets. So if I'm looking more doing a deep dive looking at other techniques of text mining, uh, looking at the actual words and things like that to look and seeing what what are the most common phrases, the most common words specifically to see what stands out, to look specifically at what they're saying, that would be able to help me more to see, you know, if, because that's why I said, because like the first one I saw Delta V, I'm like, positive. Okay. Why? So I want to know why. So for me, this is just one way of analyzing, but you have to do use different methods to put it together, to begin to begin to put together that bigger picture. So I think with, with sentiment analysis alone, I would say probably no. And then, but you have to use other methods to put in, add more context to be able to answer that. Am I, did I answer the question? Yeah, I think I understand. Thank you. Yeah. And jargon is a problem. Like I talk, I speak in, I speak in code and all so, so, so like that all the time. So I just in jargon, cause you get into your, your, your own world and you talk in this, like, you know, the, and all of that. And you just think of everybody might know exactly what you're talking about. But I think jargon could as well could, could, could contribute to that. Okay. And also it's interesting to seeing the miss, cause I see the actual tweets. And so seeing the misinformation and like, I'm really reading this like this is real so you know you actually see the tweets that are out there you know that are saying different things about whether you should get vaccinated whether you should wear a mask or just different things and seeing this like wow so uh yeah so those are some things to really to look at as well as and just analyzing that so i have one more question sure. uh, like when you're looking at all these tweets is is there any sort of like um way to tell which ones might be bots like based on how yes. oft, how often yes. or what they're you saying can. okay so this and that's the other thing so there's several so when i'm pulling a tweet it's giving me basically 90 different variables across the top and so i look at from the text of the tweets uh, i look at uh, you know, how was it posted? Is this an organic tweet? So if I see like this was tweeted by iPhone, Android, or is this something, you know, I have seen bots as well because they're showing me the source of the tweet. So, so I get it. I'm actually able to go in to look and see like, okay, if this a bot did this, uh, was this pre-programmed on Hootsuite or I think it's TweetDeck, all these different sources of things like that. How is it there? And so you want to kind of look at that and also extract that because I want to look more at tweets that are posted. I think they're more organic when it's, oh, someone's tweeting from the iPhone or Android or things like that versus, oh, this is a bot or this, you know, machine or entity there. This is something, a planned program response. So it, I'm able to look at that as well. I'm also able to see the languages, you know, what language this was, you know, Post it. So if this is in Spanish, it is literally in Spanish or French or different languages. So when I say this is truly scraping, scratching the surface, there's so much that is there to look into that. So it's all very fascinating. Hey, April, thanks for your talk. It's really interesting. I, I'm really looking forward to the rest of the uh, research and what you work on. I hope to get your web page up soon. No pressure. But um, <laughs> on that information no is, does that include the um, internet address, the IP address? Uh, it does not include the internet. It doesn't, it doesn't include that in the data. In the raw data, it does not include that. I'm not sure if I answer or you meet, I'm not sure if we're, um, is he? Is he there? Yeah. Okay, let's see. Do we have other questions? Any questions from some of our fellows? Anyone have a question? Okay, I'm looking at the chat. No, the internet address, just make sure I answered you correctly. You know, the internet address is actually not available. 
It's not, it's not, to, it's not telling that. I can see like what country somebody is in. It'll say just the country name, but mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's not giving me like an IP address or anything like that. Yeah, bummer. <laughs> so I actually had a question. Sure. Um, so it seems that whenever you pull data from Twitter, you're getting them as, you know, the, or as part of your archive, you're getting them as the CSV files. And that Excel document that you showed us showed a lot of, you know, comments and when they were pulled. And- well, that was me, actually. So when I'm pulling it in, I'm pulling in the data. I save it as a .csv file. And then for me, the, the spreadsheet I showed you in the beginning is actually me just for, cause you need to, when you, when you have so much data that you're accumulating, you have to, you know, curate your data. You have to log and all that. So me, that was a log, it's a log to help me with that. So, but it actually does not come in the, in the CSV format. So that's just for me to be able to save it as a .csv, but it actually is not coming in as a .csv file, but go ahead, Oscar. Yeah, no, you, you almost kind of <laughs> partly answered my question before I even answer or asked it. <laughs> Um, but, you know, when you're dealing with that many, you know, CSV files and you're also dealing with various projects, um, how do you sort of, I guess, because I also have to deal with a variety of CSV files from a variety of sources. And I was wondering, you know, how do you organize that? How, how do you keep track of, you know, where does the raw data come in, you know, and all that? Because obviously you're working with a lot of files and you're working with a lot of different, you know, subject matters. Mm-hmm. Um, and just how do you deal with that? Uh, the cloud. At first part, I said everything in the cloud. So because just you need so much storage and you get into literally, you know, big data, you need a lot of storage. So I save it in the cloud. I have everything organized by folders. So literally, so I have folders that says, you know, okay, Delta variant, no hashtag. That is a folder. So every, all the files that I save as a .csv after pulling it in our studio, they're they're there. Then if I do Delta variant, no hashtag, that is literally the name of the, the folder name. All the, t- all the tweets are there. Then every, all of the spreadsheets are there. So, and then I date the, each file. So this was, it shows the date when this was pulled and all of that just really have to really be organized. And so with that, then I started doing the Twitter, the data law, which is what I showed you at the beginning of my presentation. Because for me, that's very helpful to know, well, what do I have and when did I have it? And so as, and so sometimes as I'm looking at, just looking at, I open up a CSV file and I see something. So reason why I like at the beginning, for one, I I had, there was data, I said, delete rows. So interesting when the stimulus checks uh, with those tweets, I kept seeing like all these tweets that didn't seem to be related at all to the Delta variant. Like the person that tweeted, they had del- they had hashtag stimulus uh, checks and Delta variant. They had that more so to get more uh, popularity for their tweets, but the actual content of the tweet is unrelated. So I didn't want to analyze that. So I kind of go through it. I'm scrolling, just spot checking what the tweets are, are what the tweets are saying. So I'm making a note. Okay, delete these rows because I'm looking at this like it's totally unrelated at all. But, you know, with you put a hashtag on a tweet, you know, anybody that clicks on that hashtag is going to show up in that and that they were trying to promote something. They're trying to promote music. Uh, Interesting enough, music and songs. I'm like, what? So I started. So for me, as I started going through and everything, I'm making comments uh, in there to say, okay, delete these. So when I started analyzing this, do not include this in there. Now, another thing that helps me to stay organized in our studio, you'll notice I had like hashtag. So the hashtag tells our studio, do not run this line of code. So I use this also as an electronic notebook, another way that I use to keep myself organized, the data that I pulled. So I'm making notes to say, I did this on this, all the different products I've worked with over time. I don't remember, well, why did I make that decision? So I make notes inside by saying hashtag. So our studio is not going to run that line of code. Like yesterday, I renamed a file. And so I put a note in there to say, okay, I renamed this file on this date. So if later on I go and if I looked at it, like, well, why is this different from this? 
already have why. So that's a, another way of the what I use to to keep uh, to stay organized. Okay, thank you so much. Oh, all right. I'm looking. I have a follow up question on that. Yeah. Go sure. ahead. So April, I mean, you're talking like a couple of 60,000 tweets. Are you checking those all by hand or manually, or are you doing some automated processing to confirm that the hashtag applies to the actual content? Well, I, this is over time. So I'm not looking at everything over time. It depends on what the focus is because some things there, like I said, there's data I haven't analyzed yet. So that's why I said there's information I'm just showing, like I pulled it in. But if there's something specifically I really wanna focus on for whatever purpose, like right now, because my next article will be out in a couple of weeks and I wanna talk about the Delta variant and booster shots and things like that. So I look at by by week, and so if there's something about a timeline, I pick and choose when I'm looking at things. I'm not like looking at things and I'll just kind of spot check on the screen and things like that. But also to, as I'm analyzing, I'm doing like, uh, I'm doing text mining, things like that, it's going to pull things as well. And as I'm cleaning data, it's going to get rid of words, and hashtags and stuff to match. So I do, I'm able to look, but our studio is going to pull what I program. So it's going to, if it says, hashtag Delta variant that is in that tweet because that's what it's pulling. All right, any other questions for April? Looking for hands and things, not seeing any. Okay, I think we, oh wait, wait, I think I saw a hand. Uh, Nice Hi, it's Katie. Sorry. Hey, Katie, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> um, I have a question. Could this information eventually be used by, say, the press to target the delivery of like news articles and stuff in the future more effectively? Say, if you recognize that people were talking about Delta poorly um, and then you didn't, I don't know, if you didn't want to run a story that was received negatively. Okay, well, first, when I say college, I'm a college within my profession, so don't work like the CNN or, or MSNBC. I'm a college for my profession, which is PA Times. First of all, the data is de-identified. So it's really looking at uh, just kind of de-identified. So it's not, it's not going to show anybody's name or their Twitter handle or things like that. So I put things in a way, it, when me more, when I'm talking about things, it's more from a more high level uh, with that. And so, but I want to clarify, like, you know, I'm not like a news columnist. This is just, you know, sharing aspects of like research and things that I've done. But anything, you know, uh, in terms of like any, I don't use any like personal identifiable information uh, and things like that. So with in the way that I use it for research and all of that, uh, I would never put any put really was setting have anything I would never do anything that will have a, a situation uh, like that to where someone is targeting this that and the other uh, with the Delta variant was more so from looking at from a public health perspective from a policy perspective because tweets you know tweets they could they could be the CDC tweeting or it's just it's anybody that's tweeting about a particular topic or focus uh, but I would never set up anything to where there could be something that's negative. Uh, in terms of like, you know, interpretation of that. But uh, with this, and as you, if any of you uh, get into, uh, to, to get a Twitter developer account, you get into to use doing this type of research for whatever your research areas are and everything, but I think it, uh, but it's, uh, it's de-identified. So it's to protect people, but it's looking at kind of like a, a culmination of themes of a high, a high level, if that, if that makes sense. Hope I asked your question, Katie. Yeah, it wasn't, I wasn't implying that you would target specific people, but say like you could identify trends based on your de-identified data. And then as a, like a, I don't know, if someone worked for CNN, they could say, oh, well, this is a bad time to drop a story that has, I don't know, <laughs> <Okay>. positive, positive <laughs> information on, you know, the J&J &J vaccine or something, because everybody's tweeting bad things about it, or I don't know. But yeah, yeah, well, that part with J&J, with &J, that note is more so for me to like, oh, there's probably going to be more and more uh, tweets about J&J, &J because when something is mentioned, 
Uh, but mine is more descriptive because again, you know, the PA Times uh, is for, it's, American, it's the American Society for Public Administration. It's a professional uh, society for public administrators, for researchers, PA researchers, PA practitioners. So one, someone would have to be actually looking at PA Times to even know what is said um, and everything. But I would, for, would probably would try to put anything that would be where something picks up if something feels about CNN about something I wrote, that would be really interesting. Uh, but uh, would be really interesting if something was picked up. But um, yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, it's interesting. But it's always those things I try to really consider so many different aspects of, of results and, and, and what I'm saying as well, because I'm a, I'm a researcher, I'm a practitioner, and I also represent so many different entities and, 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 and things like that. So I try to be really, you know, and, and I wasn't, we want, just wanted to just clarify, I just wanted to say that, it, yeah, we use it in a negative way uh, or anything like that with the data, but just really the insight and really kind of just as I, you know, as I publish things, it's more of just showing more and more of how uh, social scientists can use machine learning, artificial intelligence, these are the ways. And so these are the specific areas within our discipline of how we can employ these, these algorithms, these tools. And, and this is how we can get new information. Uh, this is how, just how this is, you know, uh, can, can help within our profession to solve problems. You have something in the chat box? No, I think we're good. Huh? Yep. All right. Okay, well, um, let's see. If there's no more questions, no further questions for today, um, I'd like to thank our speaker again. April, this was fascinating. People just love this. I, but really, thank you for coming and, and, um, and sharing your work. This is, this is the first time I've really heard about this kind of analysis and especially focused on Twitter, which I think is super interesting. So it is. <laughs> and there's also people who have used Facebook uh, as well. I'm not into Facebook. I'm not sure it's, you know, if that's a rabbit hole to go down, yeah, but we'll people also use like, you know, Facebook for research and stuff like that. That's probably not a direction I would go. It is, but it really is fascinating. If you can't tell from, it's really fascinating. Yeah. Terrific. All right. Well, thank you so much. And I think um, we're going to say goodbye to everybody except their, for the fellows. We actually have a fellows meeting after this. So um, thanks so much, April. Um, thank you. Thank yeah. you all for attending. And thank you for the invitation uh, to, to talk today about how AI is used in the social sciences. Thank you. And hope you have yeah. a great rest of the day. Thank you. Okay, cool.